Thank you so much for joining us today, Randy. We are so, so excited to talk to you. So first and foremost, what inspired you to focus on family law? Ooh, that's a loaded question. So a lot of a lot of things, but really it was just an evolution. I started my practice when I had been out of law school th- for three years. I had done nothing but litigation, you know, courtroom work, representing people. And I started, I was single and I was young and I was hungry and I took everything that came in the door. And uh, after a year or two, I started to realize that people that came in because I was young and hungry and said, will you handle my traffic court case or my DUI case? It was because I was young and cheap. And the people that came in for family law really appreciated what I did and said, you know, you really helped me through this. And it just it felt more rewarding. And I just made a decision early on that we were going to say, you know, my email address would be rkessler at family law or at, at whatever the firm's name was back then. And um, and if I didn't get the other business because everyone thought I was limited to only doing family law, so be it. It just felt better. It felt right. And, you know, I have this feeling that, you know, you're good at what you're passionate about and you're passionate about whatever you're good at. And I, I guess I was good at it because I was passionate about it or vice versa. But for good or bad, it started back then. And uh, and it's been a straight run ever since I've never changed from it. Love doing it. Enjoy doing it. Enjoy the relationships after the fact, three years down the road when I see somebody and, and know that I helped them. So I've uh, I got lucky that I. Uh, I picked right the first time. A lot of people, you know, you have to kiss a lot of toads. I uh, first toad I kissed, I seem to uh, it worked out. That's amazing. We're so glad that you kissed that toad because you're so good at what you do, and I know that you've made a lot of people truly happy. Um, and so you, it, I heard you started off cheap, and then eventually you get high profile clients. How did that happen? You know, so Atlanta's sort of a hotbed. It's sort of a mini Hollywood or mini, you know, whatever it is. There's you know, there are movie stars and hip hop and a lot of athletes. Uh, moved to Atlanta. E- even if they don't play ball here, they come through Atlanta. And um, and at first, there were a lot of people, especially women, that were not getting the child support they needed, or they weren't, you know, they were being mistreated by the, the the superstar. And so I ended up getting those. A lot of the people that represented the superstars would tell the other side, "Hey, I can't help you, but I know this young guy that can help you." And so I got a lot of those referrals, and I sort of had a chip on my shoulder that I wasn't going to let these usually guys get away with it. And then I just guess I developed a reputation. People said, hey, that's the guy that, that knows how to deal with this stuff. And then um, and I also started doing a lot of work with the NFL PA and the NBPA, working with them, helping teach and train their agents and their financial advisors. So I really felt like um, I started to you know try to educate them. So I wasn't chasing them down. And they ended up you know understanding the system. And, and now it turns out I probably represent a lot more of the, the superstars um, than the other side. But, you know, just whoever calls first. Absolutely. And what common trends are you seeing amongst your celebrity couples today? You know, I think people are getting smarty. You know, the Internet is, is you know, still growing. It wasn't around when I first started practicing. So people are learning that, you know, knowledge is power. And uh, when I started practicing law 35 years ago, nobody wanted to be involved with a divorce lawyer. That was sort of, uh, you know, that's the the. the and now it's, hey, if I'm going to go through this, I want to get the best. I want to get somebody who's really good at it because this is important. And people understand a divorce or a custody situation is probably the most important legal transaction you may go through. It, it's going to set the stage for your relationship with your children or your financial security. So a lot of people, especially smart people, not just celebrities, you know, people that you've never heard of that are you know wealthy or smart, um, will come in and say, I just want to plan. I just want to know if my wife ever files for divorce or if my husband ever finds out I did this and wants a divorce, you know, what do I need to know? What do I need to think about? How does divorce, you know, how does it work? So I've met with a lot of people that have never been divorced and never been in legal trouble, but they just had a sort of a, a powwow, or just a just in case kind of, you know, an ounce of prevention sort of. Um, and that's probably the, the thing that's evolved the most. That I'm, I'm shocked that a lot of times people will come in and I say, so you're going to get a divorce? And they say, no, I don't know if I'm going to or not. But I want to understand. I want to understand how it works. And so that's, um, and I feel helpful in that way. Do a lot of your clients call you while they're already married with these questions? Or are you receiving a lot of them prior to couples getting married? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I I mean, there's no rhyme or reason. It just, you know, they see something on TV that reminds them their husband's acting strange and, you know, their antenna goes up. Their agents, you know, celebrities have a lot more people trying to protect them. And so that's one one benefit they have. There are a lot of disadvantages to being famous. And we can talk about those all day long and, you know, how long it takes them to walk to the grocery store because they get stopped for selfies. But one thing they have is protectors, you know, the people they grew up with, their posse. And they will tell them, hey, you need to go sit down with this guy Kessler and just talk about what happens if. And so a lot of them get in earlier than the average, if there are such things, an average person or average client does. 
Interesting. Okay. And because you have um, represented clients for the last few decades from the everyday people all the way up to eventually the high net worth clients, do you see the same goals in mind when it comes to, let's say, producing a prenup? I do. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm blessed that most of the people that we represent can afford us. And whatever the outcome, they're not going to be destitute. They're not going to be homeless. They're going to have something. It may not be as much as they had or as much as they want. So, you know, at, at the level where people really don't have a lot, and that's where I started, it was desperation, right? It was, I need to make sure I have a home, make sure my children can eat, make sure there's enough, you know, gas for the for the car. But uh, at this level, the, the, the discussions are the same. It's really, what do they want? You know, and, and sometimes it's, they just want out fast. Sometimes it's, they want private school for their children. Sometimes it's, they want to move to LA. So the hard part for me is figuring out what do they want, celebrity or non-celebrity, you know, everybody wants something. And it's usually some version of what they think is happiness or what's going to bring them happiness. You know, I want to be happy. This is what will make me happy. I've tried everything else. If I can just get away from him, or if I could just move closer to my parents, or if I could just put the children in private school, or if I could just move to France where, you know, my, my best friend went and she loves it there. You know, there's, there's always something different. And sort of that's what I love about what I do. There's never one answer that fits every circumstance. It's always something different. What are your criteria for giving advice or counseling your client based on all of those variables? Because a lot of these sound like logistical, like I want to move here or I want to protect and or, and or emotional, like I want to make sure I'm never homeless. So how do you come up with the right advice and or draft documents to protect them? So, you know, it's sort of, it's another part of why I love my job because people come to us and there are really two things at issue, right? There's how do I feel better about what's going on? You know, how do I punish him or her? And then there's the future. And so we often hire forensic accountants that help them deal with the financials. What money is there? What do they need to move forward? You know, and a lot of people, the hard part for me is to transition them from, look, what he did to you, what she did to you, that's in the past. I can't fix that, you know, and and I hope they have psychologists. Most of the people that can afford us have therapists or they have really good family that are helping them through that. But I have to sit down and be the grown up in the room. And you know, I'm getting older now, right? I, I just turned 60, but you know, I've been doing this for a while. And I'll never forget being in my young 30s and telling a 70-year-old guy, you know, what he needed to do with his life. And it, it's hard because you're really telling people really to grow up, you know, put your priorities in order. Let's establish a, a system that you'll see your children and be involved in their lives. Let's put in place financial arrangements and move on because we can't fix the past. No judge is going to say, she did that to you. I'm going to punish her. I'm going to give her 15 lashes with a, you know, whatever. It's, it doesn't work like that. All judges want to do is divide the money and really and come up with a relationship situation, a parenting plan for the children. And that's that's really all the courts can do. You know, people want that two pounds of flesh. You know, in Georgia, we actually have the right to have a jury trial. So people think I'm going to go to court and the jury's going to hate him or her. And sometimes it happens, but Rarely does anybody get the result they want, but sometimes just the venting, the bloodletting, the, you know, it's cathartic. So we try to find a way to do that. You know, sometimes Lauren, what we have to do is create an environment where we'll go to mediation and you can spend three hours telling the mediator what a jerk your husband is. Okay. Now that it's off your chest, can we talk about the money? Can we talk about the children? Interesting. Yes. It's very much an emotional process. And so when it comes to a prenup, for the folks that are before the bloodbaths, before we have kids, before I'm feeling some type of way about you for X amount of reasons. Um, one of the things that we've seen in celebrity prenups in general are these, what we like to call interesting clauses where there's an infidelity clause or a weight gain clause. Um, and so have you experienced and or added any of those clauses in prenups to try to mitigate some of these emotional conversations later? All the time. I cannot tell you that we've had one litigated and tried and appealed, but it does motivate behavior. You know, I remember talking to a basketball player years ago and I, you know, I said in there, we're going to, this was a clause that was interesting. I said, we're going to put in there that we all know that prenups are enforceable, even if somebody cheats, right? That's not really a way to get out of a prenup, but we're going to put in there. The husband is a professional basketball player and professional basketball players have a stigma. They're known for opportunities to cheat. And even if that happens, he's still will be held to and she will be held to this prenup. And I thought he was going to be mad at me. And he said, yeah, that's a bad boy provision. I've heard of that. <laughs> so, you know, um, so like that. And 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 we've had players call us and say, hey, can I 
agree to pay a penalty if I get caught cheating or she gets caught cheating. And we always tell them the same thing. You can agree to it. I don't know that the judge is going to enforce it, but she's not going to want to take the risk and you're not going to want to take the risk. So a lot of times that happens and people, if they know they're caught, they might pay a little bit more than they would. You know, hypothetically, if there's a million dollar penalty and somebody knows they're caught and they're worth millions, they might say, I'll give you a few hundred thousand dollars to not go to court about it. And the other side might say, that's worth it because I'm not sure the judge is going to enforce this or not. Um, it should be enforceable, but you know, you never know. Judges are human beings and and sometimes they act on their conscience and sometimes they don't follow the law even. So, so interesting. Yes, yeah. So I heard there's risk involved with possibly enforcing those. What is that 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 risk, that perceived risk of having a clause in there that may not get enforced? So I'm going to answer it a different way. Okay. People always ask me, you know, what's the law? My wife asks me all the time, you know, what's the law say about this? And I say, well, there's the law and then there's the judge. And we're seeing it play out in the political spectrum. We're seeing it play out in America. You know, there is law, but law is ambiguous. So really it comes down to who is your judge and how does your judge feel about it? Prenups are really unique and really a good um, way to contract around the law. Because it's one thing to say, well, the law says this, this, and this. But how do you go to court and, and say, judge, you know, I signed a document. I thought about it. I had advice from a lawyer. And I went back and forth between me and my spouse. And then I agreed to these consequences. I think it's a lot easier for a judge to say, well, you bought into this, sir. It's not that some legislators passed a law that says if you cheat, you pay this. You did this. You agreed to it. So I think that a prenup provision like that is probably more enforceable than some of the crazy laws we see on the book. So, um, you know, if you're if you're worried about something, put it in the prenup and then go for it. And, you know, I don't mind being the first to, to try it and to appeal it and to see if it uh, flies. But I, I think they'll, they'll be enforceable as long as they're well considered and they're not so extreme, like, you know, you got to pay me $4 billion, you know, unless you're a, a Bill Gates or, or somebody like that. Um, I, they're probably should be enforced, right? If people can contract, you know, you agree that if you do this, you're going to pay me this, or I don't have to pay you alimony. You know, we're grownups. You didn't have to sign the document. You could have walked away. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier for me as a lawyer to say, judge, forget what the law is. She agreed to this and she's got a fine lawyer and she's got fine accountants and she's got a fine PR person and she's got fine people helping her. She agreed to this and she messed up. I love the, we're all grown ups accountability. Thank you. I think we all need that reminder <laughs> a lot more than we get it. And what, I, one of the things that's hard heard, to say it to these people, right? Because they're surrounded by yes people. I mean, all celebrities seem to have people around them that got there by protecting that person. And, you know, it's hard to say no. I mean, I think lawyers' jobs sometimes are to say no. <laughs> no, you can't do this or, or you got to act better. Um, but I think that's what people pay us for a lot of times. They come to me and you can just see the look in their eye. You know, Mr. Kessler, I, I know that we're not divorced yet, but I'd like to, you know, cheat, move money around, do it. If they're asking like that, they know what the answer is going to be, right? My advice is no. And if they say, well, I'm going to hire another lawyer that'll tell me yes, fine. Do you see a lot of post-ups with your clientele? We do. We see uh, probably four situations. And I'm sure you're familiar with these four. That, um, and there are probably a lot of other ones. One is somebody is going to inherit something or, or the father or the mother wants to give their child a beach house. But they want to make sure that if that child gets divorced, it stays with that child. So that's that's one. Another one is, you know, a spouse does something bad, cheats or is horrible to their spouse. And the, the victim says, I'll stay married, but I don't want to just be nice for three months. And then we get a divorce as if it's simple, because if we get a divorce, you know, I want to recover because of what you've done. So let's divorce as if it happened now. And then we'll see if we can get along. And if not, we've pre-divided stuff. You know, and the other the other few are sort of, you know, one is the sandbagging. Sometimes people just do it because that's the way to get somebody to be nice. And then they sign it and then they get divorced the next day. And, you know, we try to prevent those by saying if you divorce the next day, then post note doesn't count. You got to wait a certain period of time. Um, th those are the main ones. Um, I don't, the fourth one is really just where it's going to be a divorce anyway. And I mean, what is a settlement agreement? It's a post nuptial agreement, right? It's an agreement made after the marriage. So. Um, I'm sure there are other reasons for them, but, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The fourth one is you and I are negotiating a prenup, but, you know, we can't figure it out and we're about to get married and we put the deposit down. So let's go through at the wedding. And then if we're really good to each other and act in good faith, we'll still go ahead and negotiate and finish it off just after the wedding. 
Do the majority of your clients um, get a prenup versus a postnup? The ones that want it get a prenup. You know, if we can help it, we'd rather do the prenup because it's a lot harder afterwards to say, well, if you don't sign this, I'm not going to marry you. <laughs> You're already married. Um, most of them get it. You know, the ones when they call us and say, Mr. Kester, I got an emergency. I'm getting married in three days and I need, you know, it's just not going to happen. I can't do a good job. I can't know everything. Um, and if they insist on it, I probably wouldn't do it. I can't remember the shortest one I've ever done, but that that's probably when it would, I would say, don't do a prenup and, um, or put off the wedding. You know, and I hate being in that position, but, you know, I'm not going to tell them what they want to hear just because they want to hear it. Absolutely. They, they can't be under duress, right? We don't want any duress. Um, so you have a lot of high profile clients and I'm sure there's a lot of confidentiality involved in these prenups. Do you work directly with the clients themselves or do they have a team of folks that are kind of representing them and their decisions? I'm, I'm talking heart to heart. I mean, I, you know, I remember years ago and again, I'm, I'm getting old and I hate to keep reminding you, you know, <laughs> texting. I mean, I had to start texting because celebrities and football players in particular, they text, but I, I talk to them. I want to know what's in their heart. And I can't tell you how many times you know, I'll have a, an athlete that'll say, excuse me, mom, can you step out of the room? And their mom leaves and they say, listen, Randy, I don't really care about a prenup. I love this woman and I want to marry her. My mom's trying to protect me. My agent's trying to protect me, but I don't really care. Or I don't mind giving her more money because I love her so much. And I want to show her that I love her. I got to hear that from them because I know everyone else around them is trying to protect them. Um, and usually for good reason, sometimes it's family that doesn't want the money to go to the new spouse. Um, I have to talk to them, but then th those people are great in gathering the, the disclosure information, right? Prenups, you have to show what you have so the other side knows what they're giving up by signing the prenup, or they have to get the person to the place on time to sign it. Um, so it's good to have those people to contact them and to help arrange meetings. But no, I have to have the heart to heart. I have to know what they really want because, you know, it's my name on the line too. I'm, I'm giving them what they want. And if uh, not what their mom wants, not what their dad wants, not what their agent wants, but what do they want? And, um, and I've had some tough conversations with the agent or the manager on the phone and uh, the manager disagrees with me. And, and I say, that's fine. You know, and, and they also have high expectations. They, a lot of people think I can get the best lawyer and I can just pay them as much as it costs and they'll do what I want. And, you know, and that's not true either. You know, or I'll get what I want because I'm the celebrity or I'm the rich person. I, no, you know, this is a marriage. It's the great equalizer, right? Everybody's equal. And if someone's rich and they want to marry somebody, and the other person doesn't want to take the deal. They got a lot of leverage because they can just walk away. And that's the one thing you can't control. You can't make somebody marry you. So um, it, it's interesting. You know, it's uh, it, I really uh, I'm lucky. I, I find uh, I take a lot of pleasure in what I do and, and seeing how people react and trying to help them get through the things that I've been through a thousand times. And it's common sense for me. And they're just seeing for the first time and they start to think about it. And even these kind of things that we're talking about. Right. They're just as soon as you hear them, it starts to make sense. You think, oh, that does make sense. Even if you're rich and famous, you might want somebody more than they want you. How could that be? You make $100 million a year. You, you know, you're a football star. You're all over TV. But you want to marry her more than she wants to marry you? Yeah, it happens. It's so interesting. So in those cases where one person has a much higher net worth than the other person, and you are representing the high net worth client who's saying, you know, I don't really care. I'm just getting this prenup to suffice other people's interests and needs. What advice do you have, or do you approach the prenup differently in that context? Or is it the same as if they were both equal earners, both high net worth individuals? Well, I try to make sure I have an understanding with my client. I try to put it in writing a lot of times to make sure that they understand um, that they may be giving up more than they want. I also have to explain this to them. I don't know what your situation is going to be if and when you get a divorce. I mean, we all remember Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson. He wanted the prenup because he was the wealthy dude. And then when they got divorced, her wealth was higher than his. And so maybe he agreed to give her X. Maybe she should have agreed to give him something, you know? So it's hard to do that. Um, we try to figure out what they want. We try to come up with a bare minimum. There's some easy prenups, which is, you know, what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours, and what we acquire together, we'll fight about later if we have to. That's sort of the easiest. Um, and I try to go through it all with them, and then they make a decision. And uh, sometimes it's, like I said, I just want her or him to be happy. You know, if she's marrying me, she's going to get no less than a million dollars no matter what. Well, what if you're broke? Okay, well, unless I'm broke. 
Okay, well, what if you only have $100,000? And so we go through that and we get to the point where as long as I have at least $5 million when we get divorced, she will get no less than $1 million. And it's a discussion and it's an evolution. You know, nobody thinks about divorce and nobody really thinks about it, especially when you're getting married. So that's my job is to talk to them about it as a just in case kind of uh, discussion. Um, but, you know, people that are celebrities or people that are successful got their way because they were thoughtful usually and because they figured out how to stay successful and, and to be smart and, and, you know, think about things. And so if they think about things, um, that's all I care about. Consider all the consequences, then make whatever decision you want. What advice would you have if you were representing the lesser earning spouse entering the prenuptial agreement? That's a hard one, too, because sometimes they want to marry the rich person or the famous person so badly that they say, we're never getting divorced. I'll sign whatever. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of those after the fact. They come to me for the divorce and, I mean, the biggest of superstars. And then I look at the prenup and my heart just sinks. And I say, you know, you're really stuck. Now, you know what you should do? Be nice and say, please. Because you can pay me a lot of money to try to fight this, but you signed a, a, a prenup or a postnup. Um, so with those people, I say, have a heart to heart. Explain your concerns. You know, you're not getting married to get rich. You're getting married for love, but you have a legitimate concern because you're not going to go out and try to work hard to make fifty or hundred thousand dollars a year since your spouse can make ten times that. But in exchange, you want some guarantee that you'll have something to be able to start over. Maybe it's a house, and maybe it's you know house payment for you know ten years or whatever it is. Come up with some reasonable suggestion and think of it like a business. Um, and I think that's legitimate. And sometimes um, it doesn't work. I have one bad example that I, I hate, but I remember I represented a woman who the guy had a big family business and he said, I will never pay her more than $100,000 a year. And I said, how about if you're married 20 years? Nope. What if you have kids? Nope. What about if you have grandkids? You get to that point in your marriage where you've been so, so long together, you have grandkids and your business might be worth $100 million. Nope. It's never going to be more than $100,000. She looked at me and said, I'm not going to get married. You know, and that was, you know, better before the marriage than after. Absolutely. Good for her for, you know, because I think one of the things that people learn in the prenup process is that it truly is a negotiation, especially in those instances where there is an, a, you know, a disbalance in power, um, yeah. because there's so much bargaining chips on the high net worth individual and there's a lot less. But to your point, actually walking away is the best bargaining chip that you have in those instances if you still can't make it work. The only one, right. It's, it's absolutely... You know, it's funny. You must do this a lot. And you're, I know when you're involved with Hello Prenup and they're, they're really good at it. Um, people ask me, you know, who wins in a prenup negotiation? And it's not really a winner, but the person that has the leverage, it's just what you said. It's whoever is really willing to walk away. And, you know, everyone's romantic and everyone thinks both people love each other. They want to get married. To me, there's always somebody who wants it a little bit more, right? If you really push comes to shove, you both really love each other. But one of them is either more mature or has been married before or just... You know, there's always somebody who, if you really could get down to it and dig in their mind, somebody wants it a little bit more. That person loses the leverage if they're not willing to walk away. And they say, you know what? I don't even need a prenup because I don't want to scare her or I'll give her more than I think I should because I want her uh, for whatever reason. So, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's uh, that that's really the, the, the key to it is who is willing to walk away. You know, and sometimes it's a bluff. And uh, it's a tough thing to bluff with, right? It's your whole life and your whole future. But, you know, celebrities have an advantage too because it goes both ways. If you're a celebrity, people want you. They're attracted to you. They, they think there's a lifestyle that comes along with it. There's doors that open. On the other hand, you know, celebrities are used to everyone feeling that way about them. And their spouse usually doesn't. And, you know, I've been asked before a lot about celebrity divorces. And I think that's one of the problems is they're used to the whole world adoring them and thinking that they are God's gift to their, you know, uh, field or their industry, but to their spouse, they're just their spouse. And to their spouse, they're feeling the same way, right? The whole world is, is worshiping them. So, you know, it's, it's really unique. And I'm so lucky to get to sort of watch this from the inside and, and see it play out. It's, um, it's really interesting. Yes. We would love to live in your brain for a day, especially uh, the whole Hello Prino uh, team. <laughs> just see it all. What very is part of my brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You could just segment us off of the prenup part. What is the craziest prenup clause that you have encountered? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, that is a tough one. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I can't really think of what the toughest one. I mean, I, I think the the adultery provisions, the weight provisions, the um, 
you know, we've had people ask to put in there that you're not allowed to use illegal drugs. And I have this discussion and turns into an argument that you don't have to contract to not do illegal drugs. You're not allowed to do illegal drugs. You're not going to go to court and say, judge, he did cocaine and that was against the prenup. <laughs> You'll say, judge, he did cocaine. And that's against the law. You know, we're going to jail. <laughs> that's a little bit bigger of leverage. You know, you can just call the police. So I, I can't really think of one that was so extreme. Um, but uh, I, I've seen them where it's about a piece of property. I've seen them about pets. Pets are always uh, really interesting ones. And then what do you do if it's, you know, that pet's gone and then the next pet, is it a replacement pet? Is it a sibling to the pet? Is it a, you know, is it a puppy from that? You know, I've seen people get really detailed about sometimes more than children, they get uh, possessive about, about pets. Um, those are interesting. I know that child custody is not something you can contract in most prenups in most states, right? Right. Is there any advice that you have for engaged couples high profile clients to everyday individuals to think about when it comes to their prenup and if they want to become parents someday. Yeah, a couple of things, I, you know, and, and the Michael Jackson situation was sort of interesting, right? Because, you know, who's going to be the guardian for his children? And he put some stuff in his will and it, it helps guide the court. If I was a judge, I'd want to know what did the parent want um, and what do they grant? And we see this a lot with, you know, with um, frozen embryos is a good example, you know, because what are we going to do with frozen embryos? Um, you can't really decide ahead of time, but you can say what our intentions are. And the courts can sort of say, well, back then you agreed. You know, of course, they can always come back and say, yeah, well, back then she wasn't a drug dealing cocaine addict. So, you know, back then I thought she'd be a good mother. Or he'd be a good dad. Um, I think the best thing is to see an estate planning lawyer and to see a, a lawyer that specializes in wills and things like that. Um, and also financially, if you have the money, set up the financial arrangements for your children, the funds, the trust funds, the college accounts. And if you're managing those, that gives you a little bit of control over your children's future, deciding, you know, what college they're going to go to, that kind of thing. But I think that that is helpful. And just be honest with your spouse and, and put whatever you want in writing that we expect and we plan to raise our children in this religion. And, and our goal right now is to private teach them because the school system in our state is not good. Or, we you know, we expect to have them uh, be able to make whatever religious choices they want. You know, I think it's still a little too soon for to talk about, you know, sexual identity and that kind of stuff. I, that's probably coming down the pike, you know, you know, when do you let your children decide, you know, or, or that kind of stuff. Um, that, that may be the next evolution after we, you know, yeah. we're just getting to surrogacy and frozen embryos. And, uh, you know, I can't even start to think about, it. you know, there's children, there's rights for your children's privacy rights and who decides I've had that children of celebrities, who gets to decide if they're on the reality TV show or, or, you know, is it the mother or the father? Or is it the star or the non-star? Um, and, and you know, maybe you have a right to preview the show before you let the, the network air the, the show. There's so many things to think about. But as far as custody, um, it's hard because when you go into a marriage, right, you think you're both going to be good parents and you both should have access to the children. You say all the right things um, and something changes. You know, it, it's really hard to predict that. I guess that's the beauty of life. You know, I still go back to when I had my daughter and they let me and my wife leave the hospital and everyone feels this way. You know, how, why are you letting me do this? I, I don't know what you're doing. You, know, can you, give me this? I, you guys are coming with us, right? <laughs> right, right okay. Where's the manual? <laughs> you know? So, No, it's so true. And I think the other equalizer is no matter how much money you have, once you become a parent, we're all in this together. There is no manual. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Your, your feelings for your children are so genuine and intense. Um, when it comes to clients and celebrity clients, do you have a dream client that you would love to work with? Hypothetically, I mean, hypothetically, I mean, a, a client that can pay my bills that says, you tell me what to do and I will do it. Um, yeah. And, I, and I've represented a lot of them. I mean, I've had one who said he wanted to be a gold star client and he had a child. It turned out that found out wasn't his. And he, we did everything right. We went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. He started passing laws. He, like, I would say, I need this document. He would go get it from the courthouse. But as far as dream client, no, I like the variety. I mean, I really like. Uh, there's not one type of client. I like seeing all different sides. I guess my favorite thing is when someone says, "I've got something you never heard before," you know, and then my ears perk up, and I, I'm like, "Really?" You know? Yeah. And uh, and I and I hope it is something I haven't heard before because then it makes me think and makes me try to figure out something new. Um, so that's, you know, new stuff. Uh, I like new stuff. I'm, I love that I'm not just a contract lawyer going over the same contract. Um, no, and I, and I get to meet so many different people and see so many different things. And, uh, 
you know, then I, I try to use the best of it at home and it still never works out. I got to figure out my own way to live my own life. And, you know, we're all human and we're all individuals. So uh, the ideal client, that's a great question. I, you know, I'll tell you one thing though, is be careful what you wish for. That, that may be my next seminar that I, that I present on, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of really high profile clients and wealthy clients, but we don't make a percentage, right? It's not like if I represent somebody worth $200 million, I get a percentage of whatever they get. I bill by the hour. And if I spend a hundred hours, I make more money than if I spend 50 hours. Um, so it doesn't matter if you have a $200 million client or a $10 million client, if they can pay my bill, they can pay my bill. But the risk is greater, right? I mean, a mistake, a Bill Gates mistake on his divorce, uh, a Jeff Bezos $135 billion mistake, that's a, a 1% mistake is a over a billion dollars. So you gotta be careful about that. So I don't think that just because a client is rich, super rich, that they're a dream client. I like that most of our clients can afford us. Uh, I like that most of them take my advice because I'm lucky enough to have a reputation where they say, I had a client today tell me, if you tell me that's the right thing to do, I'll do it. That, that feels great. And then I say, no, you need to think about this. Um, you know, if, if lawyers can get to that place, it's a wonderful place to be. It's a lot more responsibility because you could say to do something that you know is wrong and people might do it. So it's that much more responsibility. But I, 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 I'm happy where I am. I'm lucky to be where I am. I feel great about um, the years I've put in. And uh, I just hope I can keep doing what I'm doing for the rest of my life. I love it. Well, you're amazing at it. So thank you so much for doing it. Do you think everyone should get a prenup? No, no, I don't have a prenup. Oh, why? You know, I, uh, I joked that I, I didn't get married till I was in my forties. We dated off and on for a long time and I knew this was right. And I trusted her and I didn't want to put that headache into it. And also I'm a divorce lawyer. And so then is it unbecoming that I'm trying, and then it involves another lawyer on the other side that, um, but it just wasn't, it wasn't right for us. We'd been together forever. And, and I figured whatever happens, it's not gonna be worse. And I've seen people come out worse with a prenup than with a prenup, right? Like we talked about earlier, somebody wants to say, you know, I'll tell you what, I want a prenup, but I want you to feel good about it. I'm gonna give you X. I may offer more than the judge would give him or her. So I don't have one. I don't think it's for everybody. I think it's for second marriages, for people that have spent a lot on a lawyer the first time and don't wanna to have to spend a lot on a lawyer the second time. Um, for people whose families have a lot of money and they want to show their parents and their family that, look, my spouse is not in it for the money. We've got our finances arranged. Um, those situations are probably better, but it depends on the personality of the couple. And um, I don't think it's for everybody. I think it. Uh, I think everyone should consider it. That may be the better question. Everyone should talk about it, think about it and consider it and then decide if it's right for them. Interesting. If judges all played by the same rules, like attorneys do, where there wasn't like a, you know, I, I woke up today and I decided I'm going to do this versus that kind of equation when it comes to family law. Would that change your perspective on if you think everyone should get a prenup? No, I, I still think it's a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's just a piece of paper, right? It's a law and it's injecting law and lawyers into your life. I think you should think about it. And uh, I, I do think all things being equal, everyone should have a prenup. And, and that's funny because it's contrary to my own financial interest. I make a lot more money in a divorce if there's no prenup, right? If someone, if you came to me and said, you know, I got this messy, ugly divorce, but there's a prenup, I'd say, well, you're stuck with what's in the prenup. Don't pay me a lot of money. Um, but I think everyone should think about it. And, and all things being equal, if you could figure that out ahead of time, even though I don't make as much money, if it's a fair prenup, if each side comes away with something, I'm relieved because I don't have to figure out what's right for that family. They did it. And whether they like it or don't, they were grownups, they were adults, they had counsel, they had family input, and they decided what they wanted in the event of a divorce and they got to live with it. And I didn't cause that solution and I didn't mess up their case. They're living with what they decided um, and they've got no one to blame but themselves. So all things being equal, yeah, everyone should have a prenup. Amazing. Do you have any advice for women when it comes to prenups? Yeah. Same advice I have for men when it comes to prenups, you know, same thing. Just think about what you want. I mean, there are really two things with prenups. One, how is the discussion going to affect your relationship? And, you know, if, if it's really going to hurt your relationship, that may mean you have to think more about your relationship. Right. Um, but once you get past that, that thought, then the next question is, what would I be OK with? Not how much can I get, but what would I be OK with? What's my security blanket? You know, we can leave something to fight about later. 
but the bare minimum, I want us each to be okay. So whatever the marital pot is, let's say we each get X. Let's let's guarantee we each get 25% of whatever's in the marital pot. And then we can fight about the rest. What's my comfort level? I just don't want to walk away with nothing. And I don't want her to feel like she's walking away with nothing. So my advice is get a lawyer, talk to Hello Prenup, talk to a divorce firm, talk to somebody and just see what it means uh, and, and talk to friends who have it. You know, just get knowledge. You know, measure twice, cut once. You can always uh, measure 15 times. But once you cut the rug to figure out if it's going to fit the space, you can't go back and, and cut it again. So um, just knowledge is power. Get as much information, read and, uh, and just think about it. Don't be afraid to think about divorce or prenups. Don't be afraid to talk to lawyers. It's your life. You may love this person, but you know ultimately we're each responsible for ourselves. So think about what's good for you and, um, and then make a decision. That's amazing advice. And I love your example of measure 15 times cut once. Yeah. How... That's my, my, grand, my step-grandfather was a furrier in New Orleans. And I don't know how he sold fur coats and made a living in New Orleans. Right. But... But that was his saying, you know, measure twice, cut once. So, I love that. That's so applicable in so many places. I'm, I'm going to take away a lot with that. Um, what advice do you have for someone who wants to approach their partner with the prenup conversation, but they're not entirely sure how to do it? Honestly, talk to me first. You know, talk to a lawyer. Talk to somebody, not because I'm a lawyer, but because I've had that question asked me a thousand times. And so it's not legal advice. It's experiential advice. You know, and if it's a football player... I say, blame the locker room, blame the guy in the locker room who's telling you he wishes he had a prenup or blame your agent or your manager or your banker or your financial person or your CPA or your parents and tell those people they're going to be blamed. You know, I get blamed all the time and I tell people, blame me, you know, tell them that I suggested strong. If you really want a divorce, I mean, a, a prenup, you can tell them that I'm pushing you. I'm not going to push anybody, but I'd rather them hate me than hate them. So uh, there are a hundred ways to do it. Probably, but all things being equal, just have it. Just be honest. Just say, look, you know, it's out there. You know, people are going to ask if we have a prenup. I've, I've read about it. I've seen movies. I've read it in books. What do you think? Just see what their initial reaction is. Um, you know, I don't know how, what you're thinking. Are you thinking you want a prenup? Are you thinking you don't? Know, just, just raise the topic and see how defensive they get. And uh, and and maybe, you know, color that with, I'm not saying I want one. I just think we should talk about whether we're going to even have one. And if so, what would that mean? And and um, what do you think? And just see how they feel. Because however they respond is going to help your relationship. You're going to have to have money conversations in your life. You're going to have to talk about finances with your spouse. You know, if you can't talk about that or you're afraid to talk about money, maybe you got deeper problems. Maybe you should be a little bit slower. Um, but I think it's a good icebreaker to say, let's talk about our, our finances, you know. And are you going to marry somebody without knowing what they're worth? Or, you know. Most people do. Most people don't ask for a bank account and say, before we get married, you know, I want to see your balance sheet. Um, but it's probably something worth knowing. And especially celebrities. So many celebrities are so not wealthy or not as wealthy as they portray themselves, especially in those cases. I, I, I'd want to know. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to talking about finances, are there particular things that couples should be thinking about, regardless of if it's ending with a prenup or not? Well, first off, if the spouse, the fiance has a previous divorce, go find it, you know, right. see, see what it is to see, see the history there. Cause there's a lot there, you know, you'll see what they're paying their ex and what they thought was fair or what they got ordered to do. That'll be their, their barometer. Um, but I wouldn't say it's uh, just don't be nosy. Don't act like you're being nosy. Just say, I just want to know what's your plan, you know, especially it depends where you are in life, right? If you've worked really hard and you're now in your thirties or forties, and you've built up some wealth, you want to say, look, I've, I've worked really hard. I just want to know, what do you think? Um, what are your expectations? Are we going to go in and it's all in? Everybody puts in, the re you know, a, a hard discussion that I don't think enough people have is, are we going to have a joint account? You know, I see people all across the board. I have no idea what my husband makes. He pays the bills. And I hate to say this. Does he give you an allowance? Yeah, that's exactly what he gives me. I mean, an allowance is what you got when you were a child, right? Um, but some people get allowances. Some people, they just, the husband or the wife pays the credit card bill. So I'd, I'd have that discussion first. Are we just going to put all of our earnings in the account? Do you want to each keep in a, a separate account and then put a certain amount of our income in? Just talk about those things. It's a relationship. It's a, it's unemotional. It's a, it's a love relationship, but it's also a business relationship, right? You're, you're tying your futures together. 
talk about it. I wouldn't go into business with somebody. I wouldn't have a joint tenant. I wouldn't put my name on an office door with somebody without saying, you know, what are our expectations? You don't get to be a partner in a law firm without buying in and having, you know, financial responsibilities. You sign a lot of, or you, or you discuss that ahead of time and say, here's what, here's what's going to happen. You have 50% responsibility or you have zero responsibility and zero obligation. Maybe it's like that, you know, but whatever it is, talk about it ahead of time. One of your clients, Cardi B, that you represented, she has had a rocky relationship with Offset. And recently she allegedly cleaned out their joint bank account when they had an argument. What does that look like when you're married? Can somebody just clean out the joint account without any repercussions of the other person for the other person? I, I want to move it off of her because for her, we, we simply filed and then withdrew it when she um, okay. got back together. And that's really been the extent of it. You know, she... Uh, I don't know anything about the what you're saying. Yeah, I've, I've read the same thing you've read in the papers, but that's about it. Okay. But in general, that that's a tough one when you're going through divorce. What do you do when there's a joint account? And my concern is when somebody has no other access to funds. You know, they can hire me to go to court to get the other side to pay. But if they each have, if they've got millions, they probably should each secure a little bit just to have a little safety net, a nest egg. It's joint money they're allowed to. That's one of the toughest conversations to have. And I tell every one of my clients in that position, you got a hundred choices. You could clean out the accounts. You could leave it there. You could take half. My general instincts and what I tell people, if they ask me, I say, just have an open conversation. Just say, I know I could take it. I didn't take it. If you think he or she's a jerk and they're going to be upset or they're going to take it first, then you got to figure out what to do. There's nothing wrong legally with taking it all, taking half of it, taking part of it. But you'll probably feel better if you say, listen, I don't want to take this. Let's just have a handshake deal that neither one of us will take it. But if you're an abused spouse, and I don't just mean physical, if you're a financially abused spouse or you're worried the other side's going to take it, it might be a little different. You might need to go ahead and, and preserve it to make sure that the other side doesn't take it and waste it and hide it. Um, and again, it's a case by case situation. But, you know, how you say things is almost always more important than what you say. So if you can have that discussion peacefully, you'll feel better about it afterwards. Even if they take all the money, you know you tried the right way. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Randy. I feel like I could pick your brain forever with so much knowledge and so much experience. I Let's really do it again. You're, you're good. You're a good interviewer. You ask good questions. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm going to take you up on that. I can't wait for part two. Right. Uh, what is one thing that you would love engaged couples listening to you to take away from our conversation and or your experience as a family law attorney? That there's nothing wrong with talking to a lawyer. There's nothing um, dishonest about talking to a lawyer. You know, you might be talking to make sure that you're doing everything right for your family. Um, it's not unethical. It's not deceptive to, to look after your own best interest. But um, the main thing is try, try, try. And people, I guess I'm going to ask myself the question that sort of is what you're asking is when is right to file for divorce, right? When is it the right time? And I'd rather pivot to that. And I think the only time you file for divorce is when you just can't see being together a day longer and you know your life will be better, no ifs, ands, or buts. Not maybe it'll be better. When you wake up and just say, I can see myself, you know, divorced and moving on, then it's right. But again, there's nothing wrong with talking to a lawyer or talking to a therapist, talking to a psychologist, or talking to a friend. Um, friends will give you good advice. Lawyers will give you good advice. Therapists will give you good advice. And it's probably stuff that you already know. But when somebody else tells it to you, listen. You know, listen, they're not, there's nothing in it for a therapist to tell you that you've got troubles with your relationship. There's nothing in it for most of your friends to tell you, you know, you need to do something about this. If people are telling you that you need to do something, maybe listen a little more. You know, it's almost like, you know, if you're, if you're addicted to something and people are telling you you need to stop drinking, they're not telling you because they're anti-alcohol. They're telling you because they, they love you and care for you. So talk to the people that love you and see what they, they think and listen when they give you feedback, it's hard for a loved one to tell you that you should be worried about your spouse. And if they start to lead, lead you in that direction, ask them why. And then um, just ask questions. You know, life is, life is short, but life is long. And uh, nowadays, people live a long time. I've seen people get divorced at age 40 and be married for another 40 years. I've seen people get divorced at age 60 and be married for another 30, 40 years. You know, you got a long life. Don't, don't stay unhappy if you're really unhappy. But don't get divorced just for the heck of it. How's that for talking out both sides of my mouth? <laughs> I heard 
you, you'll be okay either way. Just do what's right for you and don't be afraid to have tough conversations and, and loop in people to make decisions on your behalf. Consider people your board members, right? Come to a jury that's, decision. That's a good right? way to put it. That's exactly yeah. it. That's I, default, I default to my board all the time because I don't trust myself to make any decisions anymore. So. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much, Randy. We really appreciate you. And until next time, which I'm going to take you up on it. Please do. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Until next time, we'll talk soon. Thanks so much, Randy.